Hello, everyone. How happy Sunday? Yeah. How you How you guys doing? Good. Excited. Perfect. Um, so my name is Mario Garza. I'm a writer, producer, director from Mexico, based here in in LA. I started my career in advertising as a writer, and I shot my first feature last year, which is Quirling Post Production. I'm very excited to be here in this panel called the producer and filmmaker relationship, which I think it's one of the most important ones uh, to have. I have to read this. Um, <laughs> one sec. Thanks for joining us. This will be an hour long panel and we will start with some moderated questions followed by time for a QA. and a So get your questions um, ready. After the panel, we're going to uh, go networking at, at the lobby so that the festival can set up for the next session. And please silence your phones. And this panel is being recorded and photographed. Great. Perfect. So let's just start with the basic question, introducing yourselves and what got you into producing. So we start with Max, can you do the honors? Sure. Uh, hi, hey guys. Um, happy Sunday morning. Um, my name is Max Handelman. Uh, I started Brownstone Productions with my wife, uh, Elizabeth Banks, um, and we do uh, film and television producing primarily at the, on the studio level, but not exclusively. And um, you know, we've we we I guess we're most known for um, the, the creating the the Pitch Perfect franchise, which some of you may have seen, um, and um, you know other films like Charlie's Angels, Cocaine Bear, most recently Bottoms, which Allison had a big hand in, and uh, and then and then uh, TV sh uh, shows like Shrill and uh, our Pitch Perfect show, Bumper in Berlin. So um, we do a variety of things. And uh, oh, sorry. And the question was, how did I get into this? Is yeah, how you <laughs> got into, yeah. How do you get into? Yeah. How do you get into? How do you get into? It's actually that's the second question. But if you're if you're there, we can. Should I jump into that right now? Or yeah. Let's do it. Let's do it. And then we'll go. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'll try and do the, the, the very short version. Is um, I worked in finance uh, in my twenties. Um, came out to LA to go to business school at UC, UCLA. Um, and had always won after uh, working fine uh, investment banking. I worked at News Corp and Fox, and had wanted to move in more into the creative side of the business. Uh, my uh, wife's career kind of really had taken off in LA, and we just decided uh, to, to work together, which is in hindsight a crazy thing to do, but we did. Um, and just started uh, looking for material. Uh, it's, a, it's kind of as simple as that. And. Uh, found a, a few good pieces of material, um, and got a, a, a movie made quickly, early, called The Surrogates, um, a not very good movie that we made at Disney with Bruce Willis. Um, but that was kind of the start. And then from there, it kind of came Pitch Perfect and other stuff. And uh, there we go. That's the quick version. Thank you. Thank you so much. Alison? Hey, I'm Allison. Um, I'm head of film at Brownstone Productions, which Max did a wonderful job of telling everyone about. So I can just jump into the second question. Um, <laughs> I um, I got into producing. I previously to Brownstone was at on the studio side. I worked at Paramount Pictures for about nine years, and um, had like on one hand an amazing experience, like working on big movies with like you know really established filmmakers and things like that. But like quickly became, well, not quickly, because I guess that there was there for nine years, but um, <laughs> became, like, disillusioned with, like, being a studio executive and kind of, like, you know, not being able to, like, champion and, like, really spend, like, quality time with filmmakers and on things that I felt, like, super passionate about and felt, like, on the studio side... You know, I was sort of a manager who was carrying out, like, the wishes of my bosses. And I just kind of, like, it's very hard for me to to give notes um, with a straight face that I don't, like, believe in. Um, and I found that, like, once the hard work of getting the movie was done and we were on set making the movie, all of a sudden I was the bad guy. Um, <laughs> and I wanted to be, like, the part of, the, like, on the good guy team, um, really kind of, like, fighting to get, you know, the movie made in the way that, like, the filmmaker, filmmakers wanted. And so, um, you know, met up with Max and Liz um, and really kind of, like, you know, shared their vision for, you know, what they wanted Brownstone to be um, in types of, you know, in terms of, like, the types of projects and also, like, 
you know, one of the things I really love about my job is that we, it's re really important for us to like only work on things that we love, that we love, that we all kind of like collectively love because it's so hard to get movies made and like, um, it's uh, just really demoralizing to be like working on something for years that you don't love. And so, um, <laughs> it, you know, um, so anyway, so I've been at Brownstone now for maybe like eight and a half years. I've sort of lost track um, and it's great. I'm not passing this. Okay, now we've aged you. Yeah. No, but I, I, do I do think you said something interesting about the idea of like everyone liking you. I think, you know, when you work mostly in production, there's you have to like have that balance between having and doing the actual work and, you know, being on time and like budgeting and all those things. And I feel like you're also playing a lot with like people's feelings because this is an art form. So you do have to be really careful on how you manage it, which I think it's it's an art in yes. itself. Still no one likes me, but... <laughs> I like you, I like you. We like you here, we like you here. I like you. Great. <laughs> Hi, I'm Natalie. I work at Cold Iron Pictures, um, and Miranda's our CEO, so I will let her elaborate more about it. But I think, one, we're an independent production company, and I think, Similarly, we really care about all of us being passionate. Everyone at our company is completely different age, demographic, and what they love. But when all of us are really passionate about a project and love it, is I think when it just makes it so much easier to push that boulder up the hill. And it just becomes something that you're excited to work on for years, even with the ups and the downs, because it is just a project and a filmmaker and a vision that you really believe in. Um, that's how Miranda's always led our company. And I think it's just read led to some really beautiful success and also just great art being made. Um, and to answer the producing question, uh, as a little kid, I would just make silly movies all the time. And my friend and I applied to our first really small film festival when I think we were 12 and we had to fill out a credit section and we fought over it so badly that it almost ended our friendship but we ended up with her as the director and me as the producer so it just always stuck um, and I went to school for it um, and I just think it, it blended well with my personality so I couldn't imagine doing anything else but also just ever since I was 12 that label was Something I took Perfect. to heart. I bet you were in the credits, like it, all of it. Like you were, you oh, know, the, the producer. Are the, insane. I yeah. was everything. You were everything. everything. It's the most painful two minute credits where <laughs> we list our names for every role <laughs> ever. Um, but I got producer, she got director, and we and actually. Where is she now? She directed and then went on to be <laughs> at Pixar. Oh, okay. Um, so she's doing well too. She's a director, too. but she, she went to school for directing at LMU. Oh, that's um, cool. And then I went to Chapman for producing. So nice. We met it worked out. Yeah, so. and I, ICM led, led me to Miranda nice. and the indie film world. Nice, mm -hmm. awesome. Well, thank you yeah. for sharing Natalie your story. Natalie was the assistant to my agent, <laughs> and so she always got me the best gifts. And you rescued me. <laughs> and then she applied for a job as my assistant, and I obviously hired her, and she then started getting him the best gifts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 and that's how I knew she could definitely be a producer, and then she can just do my job for me. And so I don't really produce anymore, so I don't know why I'm here. <laughs> um, I started producing because I primarily started as an actress and um, I was acting in a lot of things that I didn't like yeah. but I loved the roles but not necessarily the projects and so then I started being like well how can I be a part of projects that I like and then that just kind of leads to producing and then and then I got knocked up and uh then there wasn't a lot of acting roles for me there, and so then I focused more on my producing, and then now I'm back to it all. Now you're here. Yeah. Maybe yeah. this can lead us to the next question, which is, what was your first experience like working with a director as a producer? Um, well, that was great. Well, yes, it was great, because we started a production com I started a production company back, back in the day, if, if you were a woman, you could not really start a production company and you're an actress alone without a man to be taken seriously. So I partnered with a man that was a director, and we made um, our first movie called Dead and Breakfast with all of our friends, um, who a lot of them are really famous now. We're not friends with them anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and, he, and he and I aren't exactly friends either anymore, but we were for a long time. Um, 
and he was a director and I was like an actress producer and I just kind of learned to basically, you know, every ball he would throw in the air, pick up and be able to put in place. And that's essentially what you do as a producer. If someone asks like, what does a producer do? And, and the real question is, what does a producer not do? Um, we do everything. Uh, and a lot of the creative things that you see on screen are due to producers giving notes on scripts, giving notes on edits, you know, giving notes on cast, you know, who we should cast, everything. It's not, it's not all just, but we can actually make shitty movies mm -hmm. and make more shitty movies mm -hmm. if we want. And good movies where it's like a director, if you make a shitty movie, you're done. if you're a guy, you can make three <laughs> shitty movies. If you're a girl, you can make maybe one more. So. Well, thanks for sharing. <laughs> you want you want to talk about your experience? Um, mm -hmm. uh, I guess first experience with the director. Yeah. Um, I'll probably do maybe my first one. I actually had like a real producing role because I worked at as a production company for a long time. and Worked with many directors, but I think my first experience being a producer with working with a director. Um, was an incredible one, and we actually um, have a second movie with her as well. But I think it just is really special to be able to form like a true bond where you can be completely transparent with someone because all you can do as a producer is be problem solving yeah. and oriented in that and staying and keeping everyone calm in the ship moving forward. Um, so I think it, directors usually have a very different personality than producers. So I think finding someone that you can really complement each other and be the yin to the yang and be that person that they call with any type of emergency and feel that they can be completely open and honest with you yeah. um, is always an incredible experience. Um, I don't think I've had any bad experiences. But you're lucky, but, that's um, great. Yeah, we she, she has forgotten them. <laughs> 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 They're in the past. But we also work with a lot of just really talented female directors. Nice. Um, and I think, you know, since it is such a, as you mentioned, like intimate experience where you work with someone for years, it's so important to just get along very well yeah. at a core level. Um, so yes, there's definitely probably some trickier personalities. Um, but I think my first experience with someone where I was a producer has been a really, a really special one. That's awesome. And I also remember, Alison, that this week in another panel, you said that it, it will be boiled down to if you like the person. <laughs> like, it's all these things, but it's also like, do you like working with that person? Do you get along with them? Are they funny? Are they interesting? Are they smart? So do you have, like, what's your ex what was your experience working the first time that you were producing with, with a director? Did you like the director? Did you, <laughs> <laughs> did you had a good experience? Did you learn a lot of things? Yeah, I mean, I would say on, on Bottoms, definitely, I really, I like Emma a lot, and I think you know, it's important just because you really, you spend so much time with this person and like you do have to be able to, you know, disagree and like challenge each other. And if like, you know, it's not coming from a place of kind of like mutual respect and like ultimate like, like of the person, it can be really difficult. And I think like there were definitely so many moments where like, you know, I'm sure we both were frustrated, um, but because it, our relationship was built on like, you know, I think a strong mutual respect, like we were able to have these, you know, I don't even want to call them arguments, but we were able to kind of like get into the thick of it with each other and kind of like, you know, in the most productive way possible. Um, so, but I think like the respect is kind of like a big one because you, you're you not always gonna disagree, you're not always gonna agree with someone. Um, and, you know, at a certain point, like, like the director is the director of the movie, you know? And so as a producer, like you have to take a little bit of a step, step back, even if you believe, you know, in a certain thing, yeah. but like, if you, you know, have this sort of mutual, you know, if it's built on this mutual respect, like you're kind of like, it just comes from, I think, like a place where it's all about the good of the movie at the end of the day and it doesn't become personal and sort of like, you know, petty. Yeah, like how can you make the best movie? Yeah. But do yeah. you guys, I wonder if you guys have any like pet peeps from filmmakers that you're like, that's a, that's a big no-no or... You know, anything that, I mean, I guess this question is, is for, for everyone. If there's any pet peeves that you feel like, you know, you've dealt with in the past in a way or... You know. I mean... Whether they're funny or not. 
Uh, well, they, they can they can lead to funny results. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, my my biggest pet peeve with um, with any filmmaker, and, and this is true about kind of everyone in general, but filmmakers are it, it, often in a unique position where they are like this the, they are the vision, right? And that and and as a producer, to some degree, your your job is to service the vision and support the vision of the director. Um, but my biggest pet peeve is just directors who will just shut down converse, conversation or debate about a given issue, just like, you know, I don't want to hear about it, and just and either physically or kind of metaphorically kind of walk away. And you're like, well, we can't, you know, we got to have a conversation about this. And sometimes as a, <clears throat> sometimes as a producer, you're, you know, servicing a message from the studio, let's say. And so you're like, this is not even something I necessarily feel strongly about, but we have to talk about it so I can tell the studio that we had this conversation because they want to know that their note or their thought or their concern like was finding really, a solution basically yeah, to whatever problem yeah. it is. And um, you know, it, 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 it's it's often not always, but it's 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 often a lot of directors, particularly new new directors, instinct is just to kind of like insulate themselves and shut down conversation. I just don't I don't want to hear about it. This is my vision. This is what I think. And you're like, uh, okay, okay, but. That, that's not an answer that I can give really? to the investors or the financiers or the studio. Like, there are other people who are part of this conversation. Do you think that's directors like trying just to protect their art or they don't have enough experience? Or wh what do you think it is when it comes to, to... That's a great question. I mean, I, th I think it varies. I think it varies from filmmaker to filmmaker. I think it varies from this situation. But very often, um, pe particularly people who are new, new to it, yeah, they're they're kind of well. They're just looking to protect themselves. And yeah. They 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 may not have an answer, but they just they you know they know like well this is my vision. I have to do it this way and da 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 da. da and you're like, I understand that, but um, we, we, you know again we have to have a conversation. Yeah. Um, Anybody else with pet peeves from filmmakers that want to share? That's by the way, that's a general. Yeah, that's a that's I a very. I can give a I want to hear some funny ones, yeah. specific ones, but I don't. That was a really good people. one to start. Yeah. <laughs> is there any other like funny ones or just like? Or that you, yeah. I think one pet peeve I have is just someone who is doesn't tell you about problems when they're smaller, and then they just tend to compound. Um, so I think filmmakers who might know that maybe something on a shoot is going to be really tricky um, or like cause issues, but they don't want to mention it because then they're worried you'll shut it down from the beginning instead of figuring out a way to do it safely and in the best possible way. Um, so I think just. That is my pet peeve is if you're on a shoe and all of a sudden something comes up and they're trying to do something that as a producer you don't think is the best idea or yeah. overall could just be done in a, a better way or is problematic. Um, that's definitely my pet peeve because then yeah. it's just a bigger problem to deal and with. And you could have solved it you know, yeah, in the beginning instead the of beginning, like it's no yeah, bowling. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Just I'd say mine is in post-production mostly when you're giving editing notes huh. and the editor and the director will be like, well, that's impossible. Yeah. <laughs> and you're like, well, <laughs> did you try it? You know, and they're like, well, we can't, we don't have the footage. I'm like, mm, I was there, I, I saw us shoot the footage, so, and they will just be like, no, we can't. Yeah. And then inevitably the producer's gonna go in and we're gonna make it happen. And yeah. it's really great when someone's like, yes, I tried that, here it is. <laughs> so you can <laughs> see yeah. that that doesn't work as well as this. And I think as someone who's also directed and also directed documentaries and what, there's so much you can do with molding a story in the editing room. And uh, any director who does not want to collaborate with their editor or their editor's assistant or their producers um, or the studios, I don't think is a very good director. I think that there's a, there, you have to have a vision, but no movie is one person's vision. It just, unless you're Steven Soderbergh, I guess. Mm -hmm. But it just really, it really isn't. Yeah. Nice. Do you think that comes from inexperience with direct impose? Yes, like this insecurity. Question, uh, I think it comes from insecurity. Yeah, because I think if you, yeah, I think ideally you show the version that maybe the producer's like, Let me, let's go with this, and then you're like, well, I have a good solve a justification for this, why this other thing works better. Do, that, do you think that comes with experience from for the directors that? No, I think you're, con I mean, I, I, I don't think you'll ever have enough experience. I think, the, I think the question is knowing that you don't have experience, even no matter what experience you have. Yeah. You know, Martin Scorsese or, or whoever, you know, is always learning. I, I think we're all, you know, you can always 
I love notes personally. Like I love them because even if I'm like, that's the stupid. Oh my God, that was a good note. <laughs> you know, <Yeah. laughs> you know. So yeah. as long as you try it, yeah. it, you'd be surprised. Yeah. Nice. Great. Um, yep. Anybody else? Any pet peeves, Alison, maybe? That you no, I didn't really have a pet peeve. I was just going to say, like, I, I think sort of cribbing off of a little bit what Max said, like, a lot of it's a personality type. Like, I've, I have sort of, like, the reverse of a pet peeve, which is, like, I've been in meetings with directors who have, like, just, like, given this amazing meeting that they're so collaborative, they're going to, like, take every note, and then, like, they're, like, I'm not doing any of that. Like, that was just... <laughs> which I'm, like... Those are salesmen, yes. Those yeah, are salesmen. okay, like, you know, like... Respect. Yeah. And that was a good. <laughs> oh wait, there's another pet peeve is for me for pitches on on TV and stuff is, you know, you come up with this great pitch and the director and writers you know are going to go and they're going to do it and they just suck in a room, and like we us as producers are like we could give the best pitch right now, but we can't because it's supposed to be the writer director but they're just like um, yeah. Do you so. think it's because they're maybe nervous? No, I think like they have no personality sometimes. <laughs> well, yeah. I, I will also <laughs> say the thing that actually is my pet peeve that drives me crazy is when you have a great meeting with a director, but then the next meeting is, you know, with the head of the studio or someone who like really is the ultimate audience for this thing. Yeah. And because they've already done the meeting like with you, they just don't bring the same excitement. Like you yeah. can tell they're like apologetic that they're repeating themselves, you know, yeah. and like you sit there sort of cringing that like you know there's a better version of this pitch that like is just not coming across and you You're can right. feel the room. That drives me crazy. Yeah. Yeah. I guess that leads <laughs> me to the next question question which is, you know, what advice do you have for directors and how they work with producers? Like how what's your ideal director when it comes to communication? Max, do you have any <laughs> Well, I'm biased because uh, I, I worked a lot with my wife, who's a, a great director to work with. But um, but I, I will say, uh, just again, um, recognizing my own personal bias. But uh, but Elizabeth is a very good example of as a director. She's I mean I think Allison would uh, agree. Uh, you know Elizabeth is incredibly decisive. Um, she's highly organized, incredibly decisive. Um, but at the same time, you can absolutely have conversations and, and be collaborative as long as you kind of have your shit together and like you can articulate a, 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 a cogent or coherent point. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, it, it, it's, it's, um, it's the, the decisiveness that, is, that, that is, is fantastic. And you know, a director is leading an entire crew. Um, and everyone has to understand, you know, the fundamental vision and believe that that director has command of his or her vision um, and can execute it. So, um, yeah. So the decision making, basically, because when you're yeah. shooting for 16 hours straight and you have to decide, you know, where to put the camera, everyone's tired, everyone's, you know, they don't want to be there for, you know, because yeah. they've been working so much. You want someone that can be like, let's do this in two minutes. It's going to be great. Instead of like freaking out or freezing or like I don't know what to do and yeah I think exactly. that's a skill that you can practice as a director I guess yeah um and I, I forget the your exact question but w so what was the I question? guess it, the question was you know what advice do you have for directors and how they oh. work and communicate with producers like yeah what's your idea? you know I was gonna on, on the flip side I yeah. think um advice I would have for directors which of course again you, you have to have a certain amount of self-awareness and uh to do this but you know unless you're Spielberg or, you know, whomever, uh, the elite of the elite directors, like, everyone has their strengths and weaknesses. It's just a natural thing. We all do. And, you know, uh, there are direct, most directors have certain, you know, have strengths and, and certain weaknesses, whether it's, for instance, like, uh, I can think of one, one case in particular, like, some directors just have a total blind spot for casting. Which you wouldn't think you would be like, oh yeah, this guy's a director. Like, you know, he or she wants to cast their film, and this, they they dreamed about you know actors for these specific roles. But uh, I've been surprised in in, in certain cases, uh, directors like, yeah, I, I don't know, like, uh, and they just kind of defer either the casting director. They don't really have a strong opinion, and but then at the same time they will you know be insecure about that, and so they will kind of overcompensate and get very kind of you know, obstinate about what they do or don't want. And, and so that, that's frustrating. Other directors aren't strong with, um, with music, 
um, you'd be surprised when you're trying to, you know, talking about needle drops or what, what have you, and, and this director's like, nah, I don't know, and, you, you, and your music supervisors are pitching yeah. songs, and they're like, nah, I don't know. And you're like, what? <laughs> How do you not know? Um, but anyways, just having that, you know, self-awareness to know, like, you know what, I'm, this is like, I'm not, I don't know music. Like, you know, I need help here right. and, I, and I want, you know, everyone's yeah. perspective or how, however that works. It kind of made me think of like if any, and this question is for everyone here, if, if you can choose one stage where the director could be great and maybe in the other ones not so great, for example, great at music, great in um, the development, like the actual like writing, if it's a writer or in the casting, like what would you choose if you can only choose one? <laughs> I know. That might be impossible, but... Cake or pie, is that what you're saying? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, if do you want them to be really good at music? Do you prefer them to be really good in casting? And is there anything that you I just like? prefer the script to be good and them to not be a, uh, <clears throat> afraid to express their self of what they want. But, uh, oh, God, what was the, que the first question well, that you the, had? My, the question is, is what it, advice do you have oh, yeah, for directors? Here's the thing. Prepare, 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 prepare. Mm -hmm. Pre prepare, make a shot list, make a plan. It'll n most likely won't work out. Be ready for plan B, <laughs> which also won't work out, and be ready to pivot on that plan. Yeah. But you have to plan, and if you don't plan, then it shows to everybody, like the cast, the crew, the producers, and then it's very hard to hold respect once people realize you do not have a plan. Whether your plan sucks or not, it's okay. Let it. But just, you know, have one. Totally, totally agree. Yeah. Yeah. And I was going to say prep. Double downing on that. Yeah, yeah. Pro totally <laughs> preparing yeah. for give, the... Give me a director who is yeah. confident and competent and prepared and, and goes through prep in an in a organized and, and, and efficient way, and they are prepared. At exactly to your point, they will establish respect with the crew, with the cast, and it all kind of ripples out from there. And, and conversely, if you don't have that, you're yeah. just behind I the I wonder if you ever had a, a director that's... Because you know, from personal experience, you could be really prepared. You could have done all these storyboards, everything, and then you get there on set, and well, that happens every time. And there's a parade, and you can shoot, mm -hmm. and you're shooting in a church, and it's closed. Like there's so many things. So I wonder if you ever experienced any of you a director a situation where you're preparing everything, and then the day on set it's not going as planned, and then director just either freezes or can't really <laughs> deal. Like because you can also <laughs> have that. I, I had a director, or I was an actor on a movie, yeah. and the director in, in Africa, and the director got so mad at the other lead actress who had walked off set, so I ran to go get that other actress, brought her on set, and then that director walked off set, and then I prepped the scene for the director oh, wow. <laughs> and rehearsed with the actor, and then the producers came and were like, can you go get her to get, come back on set and do her job? <laughs> so, yes, it can go. Badly. It, it, can, it can go <laughs> bad ways, yeah. Alison, do you have any experience? No, I think, like, you know, that's what happens, like, mm -hmm. a lot. <laughs> that's <laughs> mainly, mean, what, mainly what happens, which I think is interesting that you're prepared for things that you don't know how it's going to go, really. Yeah, I mean, I think, like, ultimately, like, if, if the director knows kind of, like, the true north and sort of, like, what they need to get out of a scene, um, then you also, you know you need to prepare as well, but like you can sort of pivot and you can make accommodations, you can know what to cut, you know, like, cause you know at the end of the day it would be great to get these things, but ultimately like I need to get these things, yeah. so. Yeah, sometimes your three setups turn into one, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. And I would just say if that happens, just make sure to have the DP grab uh, another like still shot of something that you can cut to if, if you have to run into one or in case you have three takes that half of the take is good and the other half is bad and then vice versa. So you have like one, oh, there's a, someone looks at their watch, some insert. <laughs> no, I think you brought something interesting with the DPs because I do think that you definitely need to have some, um, you need to be able to be prepared for them, prepare if you're a DP as well, like, hey, we cannot shoot this, shoot whatever you can in the time. That, even if you have two minutes, just shoot anything, because in the editing room, you're, everyone's going to really appreciate that other mm -hmm. shot. Yeah. yeah. Even if you don't have the one that you want. I think most line producers now are, are, are aware, and, and I think especially since digital, you know, like, we just, we just steal and grab a bunch of, you know, exteriors and a bunch of just, you know, just while we're getting setting up for... Uh, you're rehearsing, go ahead and grab some stuff.
stuff around the room and, yeah. and whatnot, just, just in case. It's very helpful to have that extra, I forget what it's called. B-roll. Like B yeah, B-cam. Yeah, like Even B though you only have an A-cam, get B-cam. <laughs> yeah. I wish there was always a B-cam rolling, just any, Sometimes anything, that, anywhere. That, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that would be nice. Um, expensive, but nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very expensive. Great, why don't we go to the next question um, that, um, you know, what do you look for in a filmmaker that you're beginning a working relationship with? Maybe Natalie, you wanna? I would say passion and vision, um, to everyone's point too, that you need someone who is opinionated because they're the one really leading the story and a lot of projects we work on are directors and writers, so I think someone that has the vision and can truly see the world and the character is the type of person that inspires passion in everyone else because you need someone who is opinionated and decisive, obviously not to the fault of not being able to collaborate, but someone who really does have a vision and a reason that they're telling the story, um, I think is the best type of person to work with because you know it's gonna be a hard battle and they're not gonna give up. Yeah. So someone who really wants to prove that they can make it and has a reason for making the movie, nice. I think usually is the best person to work with. Nice. Uh, Alison, you have a... Um, I mean, I, I always get really excited by directors who can, you know, either read someone else's script or talk about their script in a way that completely elevates it from anything that I ever, like, imagined. I think that, like, everyone, you know, I read a script and I have a certain idea in my mind of, like, what it's going to look like and feel like and all that. And sometimes you meet with a director who's just like, no, this is how I see it. And it's just like, it, it is the script, but it's just like this totally kind of, like, elevated, you know, different version of what you thought it was and they're taking scenes and like making them better in the way that they're talking about how they're going to direct them than you see on the page there and I see this a lot of times when we bring directors in to pitch on scripts that we've developed where you know you know a lot of them kind of are just like you you know they're not telling you anything that's not there and then you meet with like that one director who's like just totally takes it in like a similar but different like direction and that I in find. In terms of story, in terms of design, in terms I mean, of visual music, like what? what all are those of it. All of it. All of it, you know, like. like, they, like start, they start painting the picture in a different way that you are attracted to. Yeah, and they have something, in terms of story, there is something that they, you know, to your point, that they connect to, yeah. but that they're going to bring alive in a way that's not there on the page. Like, I look to directors to tell me what is not on the page, and not everyone, you know, does that. What about you, Max? Um, I, I, I would say I would say two words. Um, be, in addition to what has already been said, which I agree with, um, the first word and maybe the most important word is tone. Um, I, I'm always looking for directors who have that incredibly strong grasp of the specific tone of the material that they want to make, and understand what that tone is because you know and i think we're seeing it more and more uh in, in in theatrical releases these days like tone is is everything and if it's what makes films distinct and if you don't understand the tone of the of the film you're attempting to make it you know and you're off 10 degrees one way or the other it, the film just becomes something very different and i think works a lot a lot less um so i would say tone and then by extension, um, uh, directors just really have a strong command of the themes of the material. Like why, you know, why does this movie matter? Why should it be made? And that can be at the smallest level or at, at big, you know, um, studio level. I mean, I think, I, I suspect most people in here have seen Barbie um, and have varying opinions of Barbie. Uh, but, you know, I think, there's any number of reasons why that film succeeded the way it did, but I think two very specific reasons were the tone, you know, Greta um, just had a, just a perfect grasp of the tone. Whether it happened in post or during production, yeah. you know, or we'll never, or, or both, uh, I guess, you know, we'll never know, but, um, but it, it happened, and, and that was the vision of her vision. She just executed that, and then that film um, had themes that she she clearly had contemplated and thought about and w it was executed in the film that's why that film mattered above and beyond just you know Ryan Gosling being badass 
you know, <laughs> um, which he was. What uh, do you like to see when, when you, I think tone is, it's a great, um, it's very important. What do you like to see when people are pitching your projects when it comes to tone? Do they, do they show you like, um, these movies, Barbie meets, whatever, do they show you links with music? It's a mood board. It's like, what do you, cause it's, it's, I mean, it could be anything like tone. You could be like, oh, have you seen this episode of this? Like, it's basically this in a movie. Like, in your experience, what's that thing that, what's ex what's that example of people showing you tone in a way that you're like, wow, like, that's a good way of like painting the picture? Um, great question. Uh, you know, it, it frankly is any number of the things you just mentioned, but, but specifically the, thi the thing that, I that will often get me to really respond to a filmmaker when they're, when they're pitching or discussing their project is when they, 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 they identify a scene and they say, it's kind of to Allison's point, where it's like, this is, this is what's on the page, this is, this is the scene that's written, and, and it's, it's often a scene that on paper is already funny, You're like, yeah. you know, and, and, and in a comedic way, of course, and um, they say, yeah, for this, like this is funny and this is funny, but what would be really funny is to like do this and, and turn it, twist it around, and that, yeah. you know, and I mean, you know, in Cocaine Bear, I don't know how, how many people saw Cocaine Bear, but um, that entire, the entire sequence that starts in the uh, Ranger uh, Center, the, the cabin, and then proceeds out into the ambulance chase. Yeah, it's like seemed, it's so you know, so it, good. It, 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 that was on. That was written um, by by our our fantastic writer uh, Jimmy. But um, but that was not what was shot. And that and that that was Elizabeth just understanding. Like okay, you know, like so this guy's gonna get shot in the head and he's gonna fall over and then you know we're gonna take you know, we're gonna have the, you know the ambulance is gonna be playing this 80s music and they get out and and just like every sequence and so she just could articulate that was like one of the first scenes she really talked about when she was getting invested in in, in the film and I think it it, it paid off but um, it's that it's that kind of stuff um, you know uh, in Pitch Perfect 2 um, you know we we had this the riff off in Pitch Perfect 2 which was <laughs> which was just you know like Riff offs are in every Pitch Perfect movie, for better or for worse. Um, and uh, um, but I mean, you know, the, the fans love riff offs. I love riff. I think they're amazing. And but I mean, whenever you read a riff off in a Pitch Perfect script, it's like, yeah, they kind of hear and, and they sing some songs, and this is the song, and da 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 da. And you know, it's not really the basic of yeah, what it is, but yeah. Because um, it just and we always say to writers, so we always have this conversation like. Don't spend a lot of time like obsessing about the songs because it's all going to change because we can't clear half of these songs and all this kind of stuff. Um, but like you know, in Pitch Perfect Two, it was just like okay, so this is a scene, but you know we're going to have David Cross come out and like wearing a robe and he's got like you know My Pretty Ponies and he's going to have a guy over here who's like hitting a gong and then we're going to have the Green Bay Packers show. Like it's just like these are all things that we kind of you know were dreaming up, but it was just tone. It's like. Yeah. You have a riff off. Riff offs are gonna are awesome, and the fans love riff offs. But like, what would be really crazy is if you had the offensive line from an NFL team participate, because that would be stupid. Like, <laughs> why would you do fun. that? And that's yeah. why. It that's actually why it's reminds great. me, like this festival is Pro Concept Film Festival, which I I think it's it's very important to have one of these festivals to like really show tone and theme and and all of this. I wonder if you guys have ever seen a proof of concept from a filmmaker that it's like. You know, either they shot or they just made a montage of things, and it really portrayed the tone or the theme. And and you were even even if it's as small as a TikTok video to like you know oh, a well, twenty. Daniels. I mean, we did Swiss Army Man, which was their first movie, yeah. uh, and we all know what happened to their second movie. Where's our thank you? I forgot. Yeah. <laughs> but um, you know they. You produced they, the wrong movie, is what you're saying. <laughs> I produced the right one. <laughs> uh, I I think that. Um, you know, we, I I greenlit that with us before um, before even meeting them or even reading the script, based on their um, m music video. The, which, and just which the idea the, uh, turned out turn for what? Up, yeah, yeah. that's because then I was like, well, yeah. whatever they've written here, which makes absolutely no sense, is clearly going to make sense because they made sense in this. Yeah. And then we developed the script with them longer and and got it, and they did they they pulled it off. But that's the only time. You know what? But did James Gunn in, in Super, um, he really knew what he was doing. But back then, you know, we didn't have nearly the kind of uh, technology that we have now. Yeah. Um, that's where music kind of comes in, and his tone had a lot to do with music. 
and that was great uh, knowing him. I mean, for me, I don't really know how to answer the question about like what makes a what are you looking for a director? Because for me, it's always like a gut feeling. It's like you see something I that you to like, someone and, or I yeah. or I hear something, and I and, and it's either like I either feel like yes or I feel like no. And I know that's super weird, but that's just the way it is. No, but I think it's what Allison you mentioned this week too. It's like it, it's a matter of like whether you like the person, you like the idea, and you want to have a relationship with them for two years, ten years, or mm -hmm. thirty years, or. Or one day, <laughs> maybe. Or marry them. <laughs> I did, actually. Oh, yeah? Uh, well, when I was working at Paramount, <laughs> to answer your previous question, <laughs> the, we, the, we got the script like five times that I, I literally passed on the script like five times. It was like a time travel movie and sort of like felt kind of young. And then this agent was like, just meet with the director and just like hear what he has to say. And so I met with him and he had went out and he had shot like, a like little a piece concept. on yeah. his iPhone with friends in his apartment and it, you know, tonally was like so different than I had ever imagined the movie being. It felt kind of like cool and edgy and like done in your basement, like, you know, and it was like, you know, oh, this is what this movie is and yeah. kind of like went into to work the next day and was like, you guys, I know we've passed on this movie five times, but like watch this piece and everyone was just like yeah this is what the uh, this is what the movie is i mean it was always like a good commercial idea for a movie um and the movie got made and and you married and him? i did marry the director wow, <laughs> <laughs> wow that's yeah that's yeah. good nice. yeah that is a really good ending yeah I passed on my husband five times too <laughs> <laughs> it happens it happens yeah. Um, okay, I think we have time for one more question, which I do want to do it, which is, can you tell us about a time where you learned something new about the producer and filmmaker relationship? Like, what's the latest thing you learned about this relationship that, you know, you probably have yearly with filmmakers that maybe you didn't have two years ago? Someone else go. <laughs> <laughs> Don't do it. <laughs> I don't know. Say it. <laughs> Yeah, everybody, everything's different. Every 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 project's different. Every person's different. Everything is different. You're always learning something different. You're always learning about your own faults, too. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, like, I think my biggest lesson, which I've had to learn too many times, and I hopefully won't again, but I probably will screw it up again, is thinking someone else will deal with this problem that I see. <laughs> Because we have a lot of producers on this, so I'll just mention it to the producers, and someone else will bring it up to the director and fix it. And then they don't. And then you have to and then fix it. It never gets fixed, and then it's just stuck. And it's your fault because not only did you know, like, you knew they weren't going to do it, but neither did you. You also can't change someone. I think it's true for any personality that you work with, but I think even just like getting to know your director really well and accepting their faults as much as they might frustrate you. The nice thing is in our work, we're not managers, so there always comes an end time to working yeah. with someone. So I think just well, sometimes. Yeah, sometimes. <laughs> if you're lucky. No, not you're if, lucky. You're, if, you're, if you're lucky, <laughs> not. I'm joking, Alex. But yeah, I think just sometimes accepting it and being as kind and helpful as you can with some small boundaries, but just accepting you can't change people, but there is an end of the road eventually. Yeah. Nice. Any. Yeah. I agree with what's been said. Great. Sorry, the air conditioning is making my nose just run. I feel like I'm cocaine bear right now. <laughs> uh, why don't we do uh, start with Q&A. If anybody, we have, we have a mic over here, so people can come in into the mic and have um, ask some questions to these amazing people here. Hello. Turn it. Hello. Hello. We can hear you. We can okay. hear you. Uh, You're not that far. <laughs> my question, my question is about the producer's job once uh, an independent film specifically is finished or at least picture locked. Uh, besides festivals, what is the best way for the producer to get a movie seen by people who might want to buy it and or release it? Um, and this can be like general or like specific to your companies. I do think applying to a festival is really just the best way 
to get the film out there. Um, there are sales agents, of course, but I think just being able to have a festival and to create some sort of buzz, and there's so many varieties of festivals. There's not just the can or the Sundance, there are a thousand other festivals. So I think that really is the best route for films. Um, and then from there, getting sales agents on board because they're really the ones that will champion your film and get it out there. Um, and producers can do a lot to help nudge along the way and get it in the right hands. Um, but I just would double down on festivals are the best route for independent film. Yeah, and I think lawyers, um, once you, you're in your discussion of selling a film um, and, you know, it's very challenging to, to sell a film for more money than you made it for, or even a quarter of that. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, think about what you're giving away, because a lot of times there's um, companies that will take your film for no uh, no MG, but they'll also own it for 23 years, and they won't put any P&A in it. And so basically it's up to you and the filmmakers and the producers. And I have always been a proactive producer, so... I mean, right now we have a movie, Unknown Country, with Lily um, Gladstone. Gladstone. We have so many Lilies, just so you know. Mm -hmm. But um, Lily Gladstone, and she's coming out t this weekend in in um, Martin Scorsese's movie. But we're still pushing, you know, out on our social media as producers, mm -hmm. Unknown Country, that is now on VOD, and it's like just about, you know, you just don't stop, you know, pushing your own work out there, in order to get people to see it, because otherwise, what's the point of making it? true. Anybody else? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Who else wants to come in and ask a question? No Great. one? See ya. <laughs> <laughs> Producer director relationships and how some directors have personalities and don't, and it got me thinking about a lot of the filmmakers out there, be it from like the 70s or 80s or even current now, that have those personalities and then those that don't. And so I'm wondering uh, have you ever had relationships where you're doing a little bit more championing than what the director themselves can? And uh, how often do you see that? Uh, one of the filmmakers I think of often is uh, Todd Salons. Uh, if you ever met him in person, he's, uh, he's an odd duck, but he's got a very strong singular vision of things. And you always wonder, like, I wonder how those pitch meetings go of do you, do you uh, as the exec on the other side of the table, are they buying into that? Or is there that speaking voice that talks for them in those situations? Have you ever I've never been in a meeting with Todd Salons, but I did read an article that where he, he talked about, like, I don't think he makes a lot of, like, I don't know, I, I mean... Wasn't it 20 years or something like that since his last movie? Like, yeah. I have, like, what's, what's that? Does he want to make one? Is he not make one because he didn't want to? Do he want to spend time with his family? Does he have other interests? You know, like, I don't well, know. He was, like, kind of the beginning of the indie film. Like, you, 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 when you say the word personality, I think you're talking about um, vision, like, uh, having their own like voice, quirky. cinematic voice, yes? Yes, yes. yes. So, uh, and, and, and that's what that's what really distinguishes the directors, like the Noah mm -hmm. Bombacks from the James Guns, from the Daniels to the Murray Hall. Like, they're all very different. They have their own distinct creative stamp of personality on screen, but not necessarily in the room, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, the, you know, really what it is is it's like your f movies, your short films, or your feature, or your doc or whatever, that's your personality. Mm -hmm. So um, if you can't display it in the room, which who can, you know, I'm sh much better in a room probably than I am on screen, but I don't know. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's, it's just, uh, make, you got to make, you got to make it first, I think, to, if you're trying to show what your creative vision is. I would just add that like I do think coming prepared with a presentation like can make up for people not being the most dynamic in a room, you know, if you are able to put together a deck that shows, you know, cast what you're thinking about cast and music and production design and location and sort of mood and tone and all that, like and that is impressive and what you're saying is impressive. I don't think people need to be the most kind of like, you know, show man or woman-y like in the room because hopefully the work will speak for itself. 
I think also to that point, even practicing, and I think a lot of times directors or different people might be either quirky or most people aren't, you know, press trained. They might ramble on. So I think just also having a good relationship where you can practice with your director, like you mentioned, and just help them prepare for meetings. Because um, I think that is to everyone's benefit or help them practice for publicity and say, let's make you a like quick quote sheet and let's practice it so that we're not, you know, excessively rambling or mentioning things we don't want to mention. So I think just practicing and being that person to help someone be prepared um, is always really helpful as a producer. Awesome. Thank you all so much. Hi, I wanted to ask about multi-hyphenates. There's a lot of directors who like to produce their own work. There's a lot of actors who like to be involved in producing their own work. So if somebody is, if a filmmaker is involved with you on a producer standpoint, how does that change your relationship with them as well? I mean, it looks like, I think we all work with multi-hyphenates. You're mm -hmm. Elizabeth, and then um, we worked with Michael Biglia, Lake Bell, mm -hmm. wrote, direct, starred in their yeah. movies. Julian, a lot of our, yeah. uh, especially I think because a lot of our films are people who have written and it's their first feature, a lot of times they're very hand-on and take a producer role. It is usually a director-producer, it depends on the person, but is a little different than a day-and-day -day producer. Um, so I think there also just is that difference where when they're on set, they're first and foremost the director. I think they can have a mind for producing and be brought into different conversations so that they have more of the scope. Um, but I do still think it, it is kind of like depends on where you're at in the process, what their main role at that time is, because you have to, you can have a producer mindset, but still, if you're on set, you're first and foremost the director. Yeah, it's kind of like TV a little bit now that we're into mm -hmm. TV, like a showrunner, mm -hmm. you know, who's run, you know, you're running the show even though you're in the show and you mm -hmm. wrote the show and you are directing yeah. some of the show, you're a showrunner, and hopefully you have people like Natalie to help you. <laughs> and I, I, I also, something to add to this question too is like, um, I think m I couldn't imagine, uh, and I, I wonder, for example, filmmakers are not producing their, like for example, you're producing, but like myself, I'm a writer, producer, director, um, at least in my first feature, and in the other ones, I kind of want to stay into the same things. If, is there, is there a difference where you see in directors that are not producing, do they just like kind of step completely away from like the day to day, like how do they do it? I am, I wonder, like I'm actually, I would be jealous of not being able to produce because I, I want to be involved in like the things that I'm writing and making sure that the directing is, is happening and stuff like that. Well, do you, I mean, I'm not sure I exactly understand, but I, I, think, um, I think, I think part of it depends on the scale and scope of the film that you're talking about. So just as, 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 uh, a personal example, um, you know, Elizabeth, who is an uh, actor, yeah. director, producer, on Cocaine Bear, um, we had a number of conversations that weren't just between the two of us, but it was a larger group conversation about whether Elizabeth might star in the movie as well. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that there was, uh, there was a lot of perspectives on that, but, um, but ultimately a decision was made that would be best for her from a directing standpoint if she was just able to focus purely on the directing as, as well as the producing, in large part because there was so much um, you know, technical and VFX work with creating the, the cocaine bear. Yeah. Um, that, you know, that I think there was a legitimate concern that, that I had, that other people had, that it, you know, it just would be too much of a burden to also be you know, in hair and makeup at 4 a.m and then have to go back to your shot list and then be you know talking to the VFX supervisor about what right, right, do, right. Da, 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 da. it just gets overwhelming and so you know i think um, th these are always kind of challenging conversations to have um, very often directors want to do everything and they want to be involved in everything <laughs> it's just kind of the the, the the nature of of it um, so sometimes just having um, an a realistic sense of like what are we what are we trying to achieve here and what you know what are the challenges that we're facing you know smaller smaller indie obviously it is um, that's a more manageable task right N another you know another uh, distinction that you know I would point out between male and female directors um, 
who are looking to act in, in this case, you know, uh, most, a lot of actors, male actors can just kind of like roll out and go spend, you know, whatever, 20 minutes in, in hair and makeup and they're ready to go. Like that's not the case for a lot of actresses who, you know, have several hours in, in the chair and that kind of thing. And so right. it just adds, that just adds up over the course of a film. Um, that's less and less. So about focusing the work and just on the things yeah. that you can manage. Yeah. So you just have to be realistic and aware of kind of what you're talking about doing. Nice. Cool. Go ahead. Hi, no, with Impact Pictures. First of all, thank you. My question is, I have an original story, um, biopic. I started off as a feature. I commissioned, a, I'm not a writer, so I commissioned a script. And then I realized after the script was finished, there's so much content here. Then uh, an entire series came, and I, I got it all. So my question is, when you're looking at an original story, what tips the scale for you? between a feature and a series, especially in our current landscape with everything happening, post-COVID, strike, et cetera. Like, how would you look at that and to determine which route is the better choice to go with, especially if I'm really strong on both because I love film, but I have so much I want to say about this person that I could easily see four to five series or four to five seasons. Well, that's, the, that's, that's what it is right there. It's like, it, it, what, what happens after season one? You know, and if you can, you know, because we have books and stuff like that and creative, I, I totally know how you feel. Um, and I've realized I've started making films and going, oh, oh, this is a series, or I've started making a series and going, oh, shit, this is a film. Um, but if you can see four or five seasons, then it's possibly a series. It's just a very, very different way to go about getting made stuff. It's much easier. Independent television is very new. Um, so if you're going to sell it, you need to have, you know, attach a, a, a well-known showrunner or a star or a director uh, or a writer that's well-known and already has a relationship with the studio. It's very different than just having a, a movie that you can independently get made. But you can do it because we did. So if we can do it, so can you. <laughs> I'm, I'm actually looking to partner, so I actually yeah. wouldn't. I would like to have a partnership as not doing it myself. Um, so I, I should have said that at the beginning. Oh, well, yeah, I mean, I know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, 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 I just had one question. How do you convince filmmakers when you, like new directors, writers, who they don't believe that they should write to budget, but then you tell them I can only raise three to five to seven to 10 million for this first feature? and they still say I need $25 million to make this movie. For their first feature? For their first feature. And, and I would not work with that person. <laughs> <laughs> That's very smart. Yeah. But how, because they are, they're always saying, oh, if you were- They really don't know what they're talking about. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's true, okay, well. I, a lot budget of below the line, okay? And then it, you can make anything for, you can make anything below the line for $3 million, anything, I think. I think too, you could also have someone that maybe has budgeting experience, take a look at the script because there are always ways to tweak things and make it lower budget. Obviously, it's very different based on genre. Is it a sci-fi? But to Miranda's point, you can make things lower budget. So someone probably who has experience, like a line producer or someone who has done budgeting, I would have them look at it and they can probably weigh in a little better of, okay, shoot in Georgia, shoot in New Jersey, use the tax credit and tweak these things. This is the most expensive set. Because um, there's always ways to pull back, but I do think if someone is reaching for 25 million for their first film, it depends on what it is. But if it's an indie, that is very tricky. Because because I'm a line producer by training, mm -hmm. and I also produce, and so I'm telling this first-time writer, producer, director, you can't make something that's set in the 1980s New York City for you know hundred thousand dollars. No, but you you can make it for one and a half. Yeah. Uh, Squid and yeah. the Whale was made for one and a half. Diary of a Teenage Girl was made for one and a half. Those are all period pieces in cities. Nobody knows it. They don't look like it. You know, we made, un we made, we made um, which was well, I think it depends God's on Country, Tandaway Newton. Yeah, I think it Two million. to also rewrite a script to just make it more contained. Um, but I think just having a conversation where maybe you sit down with them and explain what adds value on the screen, what is just expensive, um, and trying to contain it more, 
-hmm. That way there's just less pieces that need to be period because a lot of picture cars is going to add up. Yeah, I was just going to say. <laughs> in New York City. I was going to say, yeah, the, put it on the inside, yeah. interior, interior, interior. But but I, I, I maybe this should be their second movie. Yeah. And like, yeah, they should go make an awesome first yeah. movie for less mm -hmm. money and then it's going to be awesome because yeah. this person sounds like they think they're awesome. And then <laughs> people are going to give them $25 million for their yeah, second and movie. And have them show you on their iPhone what they mean and then marry them. Yeah. <laughs> no, but I do, I do want to say something to that. Um, you said he was a writer, producer, director, like the one they're working with. Yeah. yeah. I think one, um, and he, here's why I relate to that person, is because my first feature, I shot it with $200,000, and it's a period piece piece and it's in Spain and I didn't know anybody there. And yes, you're right. You can wait for your second feature to be that tell me million dollar film or you could be smart. You can contain the film and just shoot it in <laughs> one place making it look like it's 20 different places and be creative and still make the movie. So I think if this person is a writer, producer, director, he needs to use those three skills to not just be like, yeah, I wrote this thing and I want to direct it. It's like, how can you remind, produce this thing in order for you to make it? Because I think you can make a beautiful movie in the, with that money, but you have to contain it and be smart about it. Just want to say that, throw it out there. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Uh, Hello. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm so short. Thank you guys all for coming and being here. You're very fun. Uh, <laughs> I don't, forgive me if you've already asked this, I came in a little bit late, I mean answered these questions, but two questions. One, do you recommend a written contract between the director and the producer? And the second question, what percentage of the film do producers usually ask for? Uh, what is, what is, I, I'm thinking depends on the film, but what would, could be a average ask? Oh, oh, you mean on, in terms of back end? Yeah, so like, you, you know, you get paid to do the work, right, and then after that, out of the net, what you know, after everybody's paid back, whatever. Are you asking as a producer or as a director? In this one, I'm asking as a director. I'm a producer as well, though. But I'm so you're you are looking to bring on a producer, and you want to know if you need a contract with that person? Yeah, they want a contract. I just want to know is that pretty. Uh, much you could do a shopping agreement. I would I could say um, that would be uh, re my, my yeah, recommendation because you can get it back if they don't set it, it up. It depends what they're bringing to the table. There have definitely been people who have had not the best experiences having producers very early on who come in, have you signed a contract, don't help, and then tend to disappear. So I think it just is more so the rapport with the person and what they're gonna bring to the table. Are they actually going to see th things through? It absolutely makes sense to have contracts at some point. Um, if you're a production company like us, we only get involved when there are contracts. Um, but that's also because you can trust that we're gonna bring something to the table and help get it made. Um, so I think it just depends on each person and what they're gonna bring to the table and then. But we've had, remember there was that one guy on that one project that we tried to get him to sign a contract because yeah. he wanted it, but he never did. Well, he didn't want to sign a contract as leverage. Well, I know, but it was so weird because it's just like, <laughs> it was yeah, strange. It was a but I, but, but, but uh, I, I would want, mm -hmm. it, as a producer, if I'm going to be taking your project out, mm -hmm. I don't want to take it out, set it up, and then have you bring in your friend yeah. and me get kicked out, which can happen. So that's why a shopping agreement, if I'm not, if I'm not optioning it from you, mm -hmm. right? So there's money thing, there's an option, you can do that. Um, and Shopping's good because it has a timeline on it and too. They both, yeah, they both yeah. kind of do. But shopping, you can just do like, look, you've got, you've got months. twelve, yeah, twelve to eighteen yeah. months. Don't have to pay me. Where mm -hmm. you can bring something to the table, and if you do, you're attached. But it doesn't keep you from still going out with it. Also, yeah. they don't own it themselves. Yeah. What was the second question? Oh, Points. what was the percentage? Oh, percentage. Well, um, you know, really, basically, the financiers will take fifty percent, which is a hundred percent. I know this sounds strange, plus their interest, right? And then, then you go into the back end on the, on the top 50%. A director would normally get five. Uh, a writer would normally get five. You know, there's, if you have 50%, you kind of have to even it out. I mean, a lot of directors kind of, if they're not, I mean, as producers, if they're not bringing money to the table, you kind of have to wait and see what you have left over. Um, but I, if I was, the producer you were coming to, I would make sure I got the exactly the same as you. So if I get five, you get five? Mm -hmm. That's what I would do. And just hold it, they could be negotiated. I would later. just say, Instagram. like, I will get no less or no more than you will. Respect. Just th that. For, yeah, they were asking for 15. So I'm just having well, a... Well, then, then, then you get 15. 
And, and then that's 30. That means you only have 20% left to give out to your talent, which is not that much. So maybe start smaller and then say, because conversations with points, especially with Also, Andy's, 15%, have them bring some money to the table. Yeah, Jesus. Yeah. I would start small, maybe be like, here's five, and let's at the end of the conversation, because yeah. actors, you're going to, like, there's just unforeseen things. So I would maybe not lock into 100% concrete, yeah. more like a shopping agreement. Yeah, no, agreement, just do a shopping agreement. Offer right. them something, but... It's a little early. But you can also do, do the dividing thing. Like we had a project where it was like, okay, well, we'll definitely, we'll each get the same amount. The director will get the same amount and the producers will get the same amount. By the way, we would be two producers getting the same amount as one director, wow. right? But whatever is left over after, you know, the writers and the composers, if you want to give composers, a lot of times when you're making indie movies, you're not paying people more than scale, like, but, you're, but they are worth more than scale, then you want to give them back end you, want to offer them, yeah. you know and if you don't sell it to a streamer you can yeah. probably get it so you know that's really helpful yeah the, the business side thank you guys <laughs> yeah i hate the business side mm -hmm. <laughs> hi. everyone hi hi um you guys answered a, a question earlier about indie television and how it's important to have somebody prominent attached to your project um so i have a two-part question my the first part is like Besides, I know you spoke about the importance of festivals. Um, I wanted to know, like, what are some other good methods of getting somebody interested, a prominent person interested in your project or attached to your project? Like, with cold emailing or, like, um, what, what are some methods for that, I guess? <laughs> Knocking on their doors. Uh, contests. Contests. Okay. Contests. Um, film festival contests, script writing contests. Labs, yeah. Labs. Yeah, definitely. A lot of the great festivals have labs do that. I mean, if there's ways to even go through agents and managers, even if it's just befriending people, um, it is cold. Emailing is really tricky. A lot of people just can't open unsolicited submissions. Uh, agents and managers are usually the route, but I think just, yeah, doing labs and doing other things and just, you know, finding connectors to get to people. Mm -hmm. And then my other question, I'm not sure if you guys, um, like deal a lot with animation, but for like animated television or animated films, like what is something that catches your eye and makes you attracted to an animated project specifically? I'm not really attracted to animated projects, <laughs> but we've done a couple. But um, I, th I, I don't, I don't know specifically there, but there are very specific animated. Um, uh, groups and labs. I actually recently saw one, like, I would also follow on so social media. Some of the studios are doing, um, I guess they're, I guess they're kind of labs, but for, for women and, and, and minorities that, that, you know, are, you know, to help you get your project off the ground or director or stuff like that, or work with, with that. So mm -hmm. I would go, or go apply to, to, apply to all the, well, apply to, yeah. it kind of sucks actually, but just apply to everything. It sucks, but you, if you apply to all of them, yeah. then yeah. it can, it can and help. Keep applying. Yeah. Because you can get rejected five times and they will still marry you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 okay. I, 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 is, is that your question? Yeah. Um, I think we're going to wrap it up with, with that. Thank you so much everyone for coming. Thank you so much. <laughs> I really like it. Great. A great.